started a series and on, called The Divine Exchange, and um, <clears throat> which it'll be winding down now, probably next week, be the last in this series. But we opened up to start out Isaiah chapter 52, 53, and 54, remember? And uh, Isaiah 52 talks about the problem that there was in this earth. And the problem was that men didn't know who God was. They, um, they were in bondage, and they were in bondage all the time because they just didn't know who God was. In fact, when God met Moses and said, I want you to go deliver Israel out of bondage of Egypt, he said, well, when they ask me who you are, uh, who will I say what, what your name is? What, what am I going to say? And, of course, the Lord says, I am that I am. Um, and, of course, in Hebrew, it's, a word, it's the word heya. It's breath. It's breathing. It's heya. I'm breathing into you. And just like Adam, he created everything before he created Adam. And then he creates Adam, and he puts him in a garden that, he himself, that God himself planted. And um, when he creates Adam, he breathes into him the breath of life. And the very first thing that took place in relationship between God and Adam was he gave him dominion over everything he created. In other words, you have everything, Adam. Here it is. So when Adam was praying in the garden, we were talking with the Lord in the garden. It was never asking him for anything. He had everything. There was no want in his life. David had a revelation of this in Psalm 23 and says, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. There's no need in my life. Everything is given to me. <clears throat> and that's what we need to see. That's, the, that, that's what Jesus came to do in this divine exchange that took place. <clears throat> everything, uh, um, everything came together at one time, all the problems of mankind, all the, all the sin, all the penalty, all the weakness, all the inferiority, all the issues of man came together in one time on the cross. And Jesus Christ was this sacrifice and he took all the, all the sin and all the penalty for sin in his own life on the cross. And in fact, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter in the 14th verse, it says, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So by one sacrifice, Jesus has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Amen? So he's perfected forever. What, a, what an absolute. You're perfected, and it's forever. By one sacrifice, not by your effort, not by your goodness. It's just by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's grace. Amen? Here it is. And, but we're still being sanctified or made holy, set apart. We're still being worked on, amen? But in his eyes, you're perfect, and you can't get perfecter. You're it, man. That's it. And it all came because of the exchange that took place on the cross. It, we see the basis for this in Paul's writing in Philippians 4 and 19. He says, And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, right? It's by Christ Jesus. All your need is supplied to you. Everything. It's all given. You don't have to worry about the supply coming in from God. It's all been taken care of. The, um, it means your soul, all your need for your soul, your body, your mind, your emotions, and your financial and material needs. Everything. Everything is everything. All your need is supplied by Jesus Christ. Amen. By one single sovereign act, God brought together all the need, all the, all, all the problem, all the penalty, all everything. And he said, here, I'm going to fulfill that for you. I'm going to deal with this. I'm taking it away. It'll never be remembered. Matter of fact, in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, we see that he had, the, Isaiah had the greatest revelation of Christ of any prophet of old. And in Isaiah 53, he speaks of this divine exchange on the cross. And he talks about what takes place. And then because of this, 
a new creation is, is created, a new, a, not only a new creation, but a new covenant with this new creation is created. And I love what he says in Isaiah 54. We see in 52 there's the problem, 53 there's the cure, and 54 there's the covenant. And he says this, <clears throat> he says, my mercy and love for you will never cease. It can never cease. And just as the, uh, my, my promise to Noah, so is this promise. And what was this promise to Noah? He put a rainbow in the sky as proof that he's never going to flood the earth again with water, right? Isn't that true? Well, we see here, he says, this is my covenant with you. My love will never end. My mercy will never end toward you. He says, you can, it's, it's written in stone, man, that's it. It'll never change. It's just like that covenant to Noah. We're confident that the earth will never be flooded again. Well, you can be confident that he'll never, he'll never take away any love or mercy from you. It's all constant. But then he goes on to say, and my wrath, I will never pour out my wrath upon you. And I will never be angry with you. Wow. Man, you tell that to some Christians that have lived in conventional religion and under law, and they're just, wow, you're blasphemous. But that's the covenant, guys. He'll never pour out his wrath. Why? All the wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ. All of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ. Say, what about all the problems in the world? What about, God isn't doing none of that. That's corruption. Amen? You buy a new car. Several years down the road, especially driving up here with our winters and all the salt on the roads, it starts rusting out. Did the manufacturer do that rust? No, it just corrupted because of the corruption in this world. The manufacturer had nothing to do with it. Do you call them up and start hollering at them? Hey, you sold me a car that's rusting. What'd you do that for? No, they gave you the per, uh, a good model. But because of the corrupted conditions that it's in, rust comes. And that's mankind. The problems we're seeing out there, that ain't God. It's just a corrupted system. It's an earth-cursed system. And so it's coming when, even, even during the, 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 the seven years of trials and tribulation in this earth, what's going to happen is when the church is taken away, that covenant, there's seven years of the covenant of law that has to still be fulfilled, and that's going to come in. And so when that comes in, corruption is just going to go haywire. It's going to be like the corruption we have on steroids. It's going to be just terrible, terrible, terrible stuff. And then the Lord is going to come. And he is going to destroy the earth with fire. That's why I tell you, the, uh, you know, I, I, MAGA, uh, make America great again. And I, I want it better, but I guarantee you it'll never be the way we knew it ever again. Why? Because God said... It's, it's, it's in a corrupted system. How, remember when the disciples were, were showing Jesus, they pointed out the temple in, in, in Jerusalem, and they said, look at this phenomenal temple, Jesus. Isn't this glorious? And he said, yeah, but there's not one stone that's going to be left upon another. All of it's going to be destroyed. And it was, right? It, when Rome came in, they burned it down, General Titus. And, and when that happened, they realized they didn't understand all the gold that was in there, and it melted, and it fell down in between the cracks, even of the footings. And so they pried up every stone to dig all the gold out. Not one stone was left upon another. Why did Jesus do that? He wasn't saying, hey, I'm cursing the earth. He's just saying, I got to get rid of the old to bring in the new. So he had to get rid of an old temple in order to bring in the new temple. And who's the new temple? We are a temple made without hands. Everything of this old order has to be destroyed, guys. So don't, don't freak out. Don't get fearful about what's going on in the world. He said there may be a thousand that falls, Isaiah, or I mean Psalm 91, right? A thousand will come at you. A thousand at your side, ten thousand at your right side, but it won't come near you. We might be in the world, but we're not of the world. God is a covenant with us, guys. Mm, get this. 
He has a covenant with us. It's an irrevocable covenant. He couldn't do it himself. He says, my love and my mercy will never depart from you and I never will be angry with you or my wrath will never be poured out to you. What an incredible, incredible covenant he made with us. Was it because we were really good people? Oh, my lands, no. My lands, no. I deserve two hells. But God came to me, just like you. But he came, his, his loving kindness. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, let's go on. Praise the Lord. So in 2 Peter, it says this. Uh, the first chapter, the second through the fourth verse. It says this, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So grace and peace is multiplied into you as we get to know who God really is. Just like she, you know, Joe was saying, that was her favorite um, series that I did. Because she gets to know who God really is rather than just thinking, oh, he's a God out there somewhere and, you know, religiously, home, oh, okay, God. And, and never really partaking of his goodness. And by that revelation, she started partaking of the goodness of God, how good he is. It's by grace. See, what God has blessed us with and how he's blessed us is not because we, we try harder, we do better. That's not it at all. It's just because we say, okay, Lord, if you give it to me, I'll take it. That's it. And so he says, grace and peace is multiplied to us through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us, what? All things that pertain to life and godliness. So that's not spiritual stuff, but natural stuff, amen? This divine exchange took place and it, it supports every part of our being, spirit, soul, mind, emotions, our body, our, our finances, our material elements around us because we're in this earth. He's taking care of us here. We're ambassadors in this world, amen? An ambassador to the United States in another country, supposed to be taken, used to anyway, really took care of them, amen? And guarded them and protected them. Corruption got a hold of that one, didn't it? But he says this. He says, listen, his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which we've been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. We, we don't have to lust after anything. I'm not, I'm not greedy after things. I'm not wanting your stuff. We've escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. How? Through the knowledge of God and knowing Everything's mine. I, I'll never lack anything. He'll always provide everything. Amen? He'll give to me abundantly above and beyond all I could ever ask or imagine. But we need the knowledge of God. That's why it's so important to come to church, man. Get built up again. Boy, the corporate anointing comes and you just feel better. You, everyone in here, you got to say, you feel better when you leave than when you came. Everyone. Everyone. You don't do that other places. People that are hitting the bars, they're not doing that. They feel worse when they leave than when they came. See, the corruption in the world is distorting lives and they don't understand it. But what God does with us, it's all for our better. It's all because he loves us and he wants to give us good things. Amen? He says, now the most important account of this is accomplished again in Isaiah 53 and 6. And it says this. <clears throat> it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. So how many of us? Every, yeah, every one of us. Every one of us are just, you know, the incompetent nimcompoops compared to God. And he says, I don't care. He says, yeah, I love, you know, 1 Corinthians 4, he says, listen. He says, not many wise are chosen. 
Not many noble are chosen. Not many wealthy are chosen. Not many of the folks that really think they got it together. Not many people that have some great knowledge. But he's chosen the foolish of the world to confound the wise. Amen? Oh, praise God, he's chosen us. Hallelujah. <clears throat> he's not looking for a bright and shining star. He's wanting for some nimcompoop to embrace the bright and shining star, to say yes to the one that has such great love for us that he's just poured out his life to us. And so he says this, <clears throat> again, he says, all we have, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The, the word iniquity, remember, in the Hebrew is avon, A-V-O-N. It's like the, the makeup stuff, you know, for women. And um, <clears throat> why they named it that, I don't have a clue. But um, I do know that uh, uh, avon means not your, all your sin, all your mistakes, all your problems, all your sin, but all the punishment and penalty for it. And so all, the, all our Avon, all our iniquity was laid on Jesus, the Bible says. He laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus is our scapegoat. I'm not going to go through it, but remember they'd bring the scapegoat in. They would, the priest would you know, cover it with blood, lay his hands on it, and just declare every problem, every sin, every curse, every, every penalty for it. And then they'd ship them out into the wilderness where ravenous wolves you know, the, uh, would, would eat it up and it'd never return again. And yearly then, they'd bring a sacrifice for their sin. And the priest did the same thing. And he'd lay his hands on the head, and he'd declare their sin, their iniquity, all the penalty, all the problems. And what he would do is then sacrifice that animal. Jesus was that sacrifice. Problem with the old covenant was guilt and condemnation would come into our lives. We'd always feel guilty of being sinful. The Jews today without Christ, that's their big thing, right? Just, wow, guilt is just the main trip in their life. Feeling condemned, down. And, but Jesus took that away. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And he says, so I did this so you'll never feel guilty anymore. I think it's John 5 and 24. He says, I come uh, so that you will never feel condemnation. Wow. Does he love you? Does he love me? Amen? He wants us just standing without inferiority in the presence of God Almighty, our Father. He wants us saying, hey, let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus. He didn't think it uh, robbery to be equal with God. Let that same mind be in you. But he took upon himself the form of a servant. He humbled himself, became obedient even unto death the death of the cross, so we can obey God no matter what. And we know all our needs are taken care of. Amen? So we see in Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, it says this, Yet it pleased the Lord, and here's all this taking place on the cross, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He'll see his labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall give the spoil with the, or divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's why now when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you become an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. If we were just heirs of God, we would all get a part. And he'd have to say, you get this, you get this, you get this. But we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And he was the only begotten son. And when he died and rose from the dead, he inherited everything. And so you then, being a joint heir with Jesus Christ, have inherited what? Everything. Everything. It's yours. In fact, Paul tells the church at Corinth, he says, don't you know everything's yours? Even me and Apollos. 
Everything's yours. We got to change our mentality. We got to start listening to God and believing Him. Amen? And it'll change our life in this earth. Not to be haughty or disrespectful of others. Not to thinking high-nosed, you know, thinking we're somebody that's better than somebody else. Oh, my lands, no. But we're chosen by God. And we take our rightful role, our rightful position, and we let all of his goodness come into our lives so that he's glorified. So people praise him and give him the glory. Amen. Not me, not you. Praise the Lord. So there's this divine exchange. Now, the first was Jesus was punished with all the wrath of God that we might be forgiven and receive peace with God. In the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, in the 5th verse, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Jesus. So the penalty for not having peace in our lives was upon Jesus. And by his stripes we're healed. And that's what we see. That's why Paul said in Colossians 3 and 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. What's that one body you're a member of? Christ, right? Yes. You're the body of Christ. And so you have peace. And Paul says, he always say, well, there's times I don't have peace, but you could. It's yours. You just have to remember. You just got to take hold of it. Amen? The Bible says we're to fight the fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. He says in 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, 3 and 16, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace when? At all times and in every way. It's yours. It's yours. You're not trying to get it. It's yours. You just have to accept it, allow it in your lives. Let the peace of God, you know one good way, by the way, of, 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 uh, um, of allowing peace to continually flow and even in the midst of hard times then be assured that peace will still reign in your life is practice the presence of God. Pray every day. Just get into his presence, not gimme, 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 gimme. But no, Lord, I, I, talk to me. I, I thank you for your love today, Lord. Thank you for your goodness today, Lord. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for all that you've done for me and all that you're doing for me, even in the midst of hard times, in every time, in every way, even in the midst of hard times. Thank, thank you, Jesus, that even in the midst of this, peace is in my life. You're the, my assurance, not people, not people situations, not, not my job, not my home. He's the one. Amen? Amen? Next was, in this divine exchange, the next thing we looked at is Jesus was wounded so we would be healed. Again, we just read in Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes we're healed. Amen? But he says this in Matthew 8, 16 through 17 then. It says, and he cast out the spirit with his word. Talking about Jesus. He cast out evil spirits just with his word. And he healed all who were sick. How many? All. Do you think there were some liars among those folks that were healed? Yeah, I think so. Do you think there were some people that maybe snitched something at work or did something wrong? Maybe they're, they got angry when they shouldn't have. They, there, was, there was sinners there. They all were sinners. Nobody was born again yet. And he healed them all. Why in the world doesn't he... he we think, why doesn't he heal all his children? Because they don't accept it. That's the only answer. I mean, you, we have to learn to accept it. No, if I die prematurely, something happens in my life. And I, it wasn't God. It was me. It was me. I'm the one who has to fight the fight of faith. I have, to, I have to work and just to believe what he's done for me. There's my job. That's why it says, there remains a rest unto those who believe. Therefore let us, this Hebrews 4, therefore let us labor to enter into that rest. There's the work we have in our life. There's how we're to apply our lives as Christians. Amen? Not working somehow to please God so he does something for us. Why do we have to do that when he did it all already? 
Satan has buffaloed so many Christians. He's told you that, oh, God's making you sick, or he's, he's telling you, oh, he doesn't want you wealthy. What a bunch of baloney. In fact, God says in Isaiah 52, he says that's blasphemy in his name. Because his name is Jehovah Rapha. He's your healer. His name is uh, 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 Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Amen? The third thing we looked at was that Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness so that we would be made righteous with his righteousness in Isaiah 53, 10. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, when you give your life over to Jesus Christ, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. We're born again of an incorruptible seed. He says he will prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. What an incredible blessing. Amen. Look what he's done for us. He was an offering for sin. Again, it talks about the mosaic sin offering that I talked about a little bit earlier with the lamb or the goat. Jesus speaks of Isaiah 53.10 in a positive way of exchange in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Jesus never sinned. He came a spotless lamb. He never sinned. He didn't have the nature of sin in him, even though he was man. He came with the nature of God in him. And he gave it all up. He took our sin. He became sin for us. That we might become the what? Righteousness of God in him. Paul talks about this righteousness. You know, a lot of times Christians think they gotta, they got to do special things so God will be pleased with them and he'll heal them. Or do special things so God will be pleased with them and they can prosper them. Or do special things for God in order that he will accept them. Acceptance isn't on our basis of goodness, it's on his basis of goodness. And you never can do enough to be accepted by God. So what you do is you give your life to Jesus Christ and you're found in him. And that's what it says. In Romans 4, 3 through 8, Paul said, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That was before the law was given, remember. He believed God that he would have a son and even though he didn't even have it yet, oh, okay, he's righteous, he's believing me, trusting me for what I said. It says, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. David celebrates the same truth. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for what? Righteousness. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me and everything is mine. Righteous. Right, that's, you're Righteous. You're as right as God's right. You're agreeing with him, in other words. He says, just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. What a blessing it is that God would impart righteousness to somebody outside of working for it. So all the religion that says you've got to work and be good in order to get from God, it's blasphemy against the name of God. All religions that say you've got to work hard and do good in order to get to heaven one day, that's blasphemy against the name of God. Because his name, he says, here's my name, I'm giving you life, I'm breathing life into you and giving you all things by a promise. That's it, by a promise. Everyone say it with me, by a promise. The Lord has given everything to me. Yeah, he doesn't go back on his promises. It says this, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. This is the seventh verse. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not, what? Impute sin. That was the covenant, Isaiah 54. Bl love and mercy are yours all the time. I'll never retract them. And I'll never pour out my wrath on you and I'll never be angry with you. Not even angry. He won't be angry with you. He's loving, he's caring, he's good. He'll correct us. 
but he doesn't, I don't correct the child because he's reaching toward the toaster by putting his hand down it and turning it on. I correct him by saying, don't do this. <laughs> he speaks with us. He talks with us. Don't do that. Don't do that. Some of you have heard the voice of the Lord say, don't do that for years and years and years. He never crushed you. You just got to start obeying them. Why? Because there's so many more blessings that your eyes are going to be open to when you start obeying God. See, there is work for us, but it's not work to please God in any way. The work is for our benefit. We've been created to do good works. And each one of us have certain works to do that'll help us walk out the fulfillment of our lives. That'll, that'll allow us to see the perfection that God has brought within us. You've been fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you're getting down on yourself, start obeying God. You'll start seeing what he sees and not seeing what you see or what others see and want to tell you. <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not, but everyone doesn't want you to succeed. There's a lot of Christians that don't want to. There's a lot of your family that don't want to see you succeed or do better. A lot of times they'll say, well, you can do good, but not only maybe as good as me or a little less than me. But otherwise, good. no, I want to see you blessed and increased and to have the fullness of all that God has for you. The fourth aspect of this divine exchange is an outworking of the one that we saw in righteousness, that Jesus died our death so that we might receive his life. The entire Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, have the final outcome, they declare the final outcome of sin is death. And so if Jesus took your sin, what about your death? If sin comes by death, or death comes by sin, and Jesus took your sin, what about your death? Well, Ezekiel 18 and 4 says, the soul who sins shall die. James 1.15 says, sin when it's full grown brings forth death, right? But Jesus took my sin. He took your sin. And so what about death? Well, here, Jesus explains it in John 11, 25 and 26. Most of the time, we only hear this verse at a funeral, you know. But it's Jesus. Here's this woman at the well, right? And um, this Samaritan woman. And, um, or here, um, he, I, I, this is when he raises Lazarus from dead. I'm sorry. But this is when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And, and he says, Lazarus will live. And uh, they says, yeah, I know he'll live in the last day at the resurrection. And he says this. He, he, he says in John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Wow. If you die and you believe in him, you'll live again. But if you're alive... He says, and believe in me, you'll never die. Well, when Jesus comes for us, he's talking about the resurrection. Remember, I am the resurrection of life. There's going to be a resurrection of the saints, isn't there? A catching away. Uh, we, in, in Latin, it's rapture of the church. And when we're taken away, there's going to be some that have died. And we're told the dead in Christ will rise bodily. Their bodies are going to go up. But those who are alive, then they'll ascend also and be caught together, uh, meet Jesus together in the heaven, right? Or in the second heaven it would be. So here's the deal. If you're, if you're dead, you're going to live again. Your body's going to live again. If you're alive, you're never going to die because you're going to meet life face to face. You're going to be with them forever, amen? That's what he's saying. Now, the fifth aspect of this divine exchange is what I'm talking to you today. Here's the new one. And that's um, the, the, the fifth aspect is this, found in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Paul says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became what? Poor, that you through his poverty 
might become rich. So the, the, the exchange is from poverty to riches. You can't get clearer than that, right? Here's the exchange. And we see here that in, in the Passion Translation, here, he, so Jesus becomes poor, and in return, when we accept him, we become rich. And here it says in the Passion Translation, for you have experienced the extravagant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was infinitely rich, he impoverished himself for our sake, so that by his poverty, we would become rich beyond measure. So he didn't become poor for him, he come, become poor for us, so that we could have a, a constant supply of all our needs met, no matter what. No matter what. I love that. I, I, I just love that. When did Jesus become poor? Well, you know, some people say, well, he was rich in heaven, and when he came to the earth, that's poverty compared to earth, heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. I mean, I'd say, yeah, I agree, compared, but he, in this earth. And then some ministers will even teach that, hey, yeah, he was, uh, he was just poor on this earth all the time. Never, he just was dirt poor. Well, that's just a lie. That's not true at all. Because the Bible teaches differently. Jesus, he, he not only had enough cash to take care of himself, he had enough to take care of his disciples around him too. They left their jobs to follow him. He not only had enough to take care of himself and take care of all of his disciples, but they gave daily to the poor. It was a constant flow out to the poor. Right? Was that being, would, that, would you say that's a poor person? You can, even if he just had 12 disciples, but we know there was so many more. But the 12 that we see that became apostles, we'll just use them. Could you take care of right now yourself, your family, and 12 uh, uh, students around you daily, and then give to the poor every day? Do you think Jesus had more than you did? I know he did. He had so much, he had to have a treasurer. I was a crooked treasurer, but the father told him to pick him. Hey, who am I? Not that all treasurers are crooks, you know. But this one was. And we see in John 12, 3 through 8, Jesus is eating, you know, uh, in a house, and Mary comes in. He's in there with the Pharisees, the religious folks. Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. This is in verse 3 through 8. And anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Now I want to stop right here because spikenard, especially a vial of it, it was a, that was a year's salary. A year. A person's year's wages. That's what it cost. And he says this, And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, old Judy, he, Simon's son, who would who had betray him, <coughs> said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii, which is a year's wage, and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. I'm going to stop here now. Not only did he have enough money for himself, all of his students feeding the poor, and somebody's ripping them off daily now, and he doesn't even notice it. Well, I knew he knew it, but it didn't affect him. Can you have somebody stealing out of your bank every day, taking care of your family and a bunch of other people, and, and giving to the poor and not just never say anything about it? That's okay, I got plenty. Was Jesus poor when he walked this earth? There ain't no way on God's grace. It didn't happen. People make stuff up because this, they have a religious mind. So here's Jesus, and it says, he, he, um, he didn't say, let's take care of the poor because, because he cared for the poor. He said that because he was a thief and he had the money box. And he used to take care of what was put in, he used to take what was put into it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you don't have always with you. Yeah, I'm going to just interject this one thing. Uh, from time to time, being a pastor, I've been a pastor 38 years, going to be 39 here in two months. Uh, but 
uh, I, from time to, and then I was associate pastor, you know, for years before that. But um, from time to time, you have people thinking that n- giving should only be to the poor. And what a distorted mentality. Just a distorted mentality. I had a guy come in once, wealthy man, just saying, you eat, we, this church needs to give more money to the poor. Man, we give a lot to the poor. We give, we're givers, man, to the poor. Not just here, but around the world. We, we got to give more money to the poor. I said, no, no, no. What about you giving more money to the poor? You start giving more money to the poor, go, come tell me what you're giving to the poor. Let me see. Let me see what you make. Let me see what you're giving. How about the proportion that you think we should be living under, you live under? Left, never saw him again. Because he was an idiot. You, you can't live that way. The, and Jesus said, wait a minute, this was for me for my burial. There's other things that everyone has to do other than giving to the poor. Right? And things that God wants us to do other than giving to the poor. And so we have to pay attention to that. Amen? So don't let these pe- religious-minded people get to you. Uh, and they're, they're going to try in any way th- this, this, this satanic uh, desire to get you to keep you from the blessings of God. And because of her doing this, she, you, you all know if we went on in Scripture, he says she's, the story of her is going to be told throughout the ages. And we still do talk about her, right? That's it. She blessed God, and she was blessed because of it. Now, Jesus' method of receiving finances was unconventional at times. You know that, right? And, um, in fact, in, in Matthew, in the 17th chapter, the, the religious folks, you know, the, 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 come to them from the, from the leaders of the, the church there, the uh, synagogue, and they said, does your... Uh, does your rabbi pay temple tax? And of course, a temple tax wasn't imposed by God, but it was imposed by um, uh, the, the, the priests. It was, the, uh, it was their directive. And so Peter, you know, he just piped up and says, oh yeah, hey, he pays it all, you know. And Jesus, he, he takes them aside, he brings them into the house that was there, and he says, Peter, Let me ask you a question. Does a king receive taxes from his son or from the other people? And Peter said, well, of course, from the other people. Why is he not going to tax his son? And Jesus said, but, and then he talks here. He says, but nevertheless, lest we offend them because of what you said, He heals people of foot and mouth disease even. Amen? He says, so, nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook. Now, Peter wasn't a hook fisherman, was he? He was a net fisherman, right? He had boats. But he said, just get a fish pole. Go to the sea, cast in 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 the hook, and take the fish that comes up first. Just get the first fish, and when you opened its mouth, you'll find a piece of money Take that and give it that to them for you and me. It's going to pay both our taxes. So it's a little unconventional method. And I love what he did here. It's a fishing port, right? He goes to their supply of income, and he takes the money that he needed for his taxes. He didn't take it out of his coffer. He didn't take it out of his treasure. He went to theirs. He says, here, let, let's go ahead and do this. So Jesus' earthly ministry exemplified abundance, didn't it? Wouldn't you love that? Just, hey, hon, go fishing tonight. Uh, we're we're going to buy a new car. All right. No, just take the first fish. We don't, we're only going to buy a car, not a fleet, right? We're just the first fish. And they come back with gold here. Okay, thank you. That was Jesus. So he always had enough to accomplish the will of God for him in his, li- in his life, right? And he, he certainly gave out money to the poor. All this and that supply was never exhausted, ever exhausted. This isn't considered poor, is it? So when you hear somebody say, ah, but Jesus, he was rich in heaven, but when he came to the earth, he was poor. Not in earthly standards. 
He was rich, wasn't he? But he became poor. Well, when in the world did that happen? It had to happen on the cross. Why? There's the place of exchange. He, it had to be there that he became poor. So let's look really quickly now at uh, what Moses says is absolute poverty. In Deuteronomy 28, two verses, 47 and 48. Are you getting something from this? Verse 47 and 48, it says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart, read it, for the abundance of everything. You didn't serve the Lord, and this was under the old covenant, but he said, because you're not serving the Lord your God out of joy, because the abundant, you have everything. You have me, so you have everything, but you don't acknowledge that. And so you're greedy and you only want to use your stuff for you. You'll buy the best stuff for you, but you, other people, oh man, forget it. Remember when he says a gift, something that's given, should be more precious than something that's earned. A lot of times you'll give something to somebody and they'll just say, oh yeah, throw it off. But do you realize, I, I want to give things to people that bless me. If it's bless me, I want to pass that on to other people, Right? Not, you know, there's people call them re-gifters. You get, oh, I'm never going to use this in my life. We'll just give it off to somebody else. Or, uh, this broke, let's give it to the church. <laughs> Throw it in the dump yourself. Amen? Give something of value that's precious. And what happens? When you accept a gift from something, you grow in, in, in uh, um, thanksgiving and in uh, uh, in more personal, not with the gift, but with the giver. But if it's earned, you grow more personal with what you get, not the boss, right? Do you grow more personal with the boss if you put in 40 hours a week at $10 an hour, you get 400 bucks, he says, thank you for your job, gives you the 400 bucks, did you grow more personal with him? No, money became more personal to you. But if it's a gift, I know you never worked here before, but, you know, we just wanted to come and give you some bucks. Wow, who is this guy? I want to get to know him more. Are you hearing me? That's the difference between grace and works. And if you're only going to live in, in church, in the kingdom of heaven, under a works mentality, it's you only give the stingy amount. You'll only do whatever. Why? Because you have more honor and more intimacy with what you have than who's given you all things. Can you hear me? Is that, you know, I know that's a big word, but that's true, right? So here he says, again, he says, therefore, because of this, because of how you, you didn't serve me with joy and gladness because I gave you everything. Therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you. And here's it. Here's, here's absolute poverty. In hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck, and he will destroy you. That's bondage, isn't it? That's what he was saying about Israel going into bondage. Absolute poverty. Well, what about Jesus? He was in absolute poverty? He had to. He had to fulfill that for you and me because that's what was bringing all of people down. And he wanted to make us rich. Jesus was hungry. He didn't eat for 24 hours before they crucified him. He was thirsty, right? John 9 and 28, on the cross he said, I thirst. He was naked, wasn't he? They stripped him of all of his clothes. Matter of fact, the robe that he had was so valuable that all the soldiers uh, gambled for it. Who was going to get it? And he was in need of everything. Luke 23 and 50 through 53 of it. He was buried in a borrowed grave. He didn't even have his own grave. They had to borrow a grave to bury him in. He was in absolute poverty. When did Jesus become poor? On the cross. Why? Because it's the place of exchange. Do you have to stay in poverty? 
Do you have to stay in lack? Do you have to stay in need and in want? No, the Lord is my shepherd. He'll lead me how I need to go. I'm going to obey him because I shall not want. Finances will come. Material things will come. Blessings will happen. Listen, when I was going to move here, me and Pam, before we moved here to Merrill, we gave away everything we owned. My pastor thought I was insane. Thought, woo you know, you, uh, who you been praying to lately, you know? And I said, no, I really believe the Lord told me that. And in fact, I talked with Pam about it two months ago, and I let her stew on it, you know, and pray about it. And she came to me, and that's why we're coming to you. She says, yeah, I believe it's God, so we're coming to you. He said, well, let me pray about it. A couple weeks later, he says, you know, he said, I still don't feel good about this, but I'm hearing the Lord say, yeah, give away everything you own. So we did. I had a construction company. We gave everything away. I was building a house by, on the Menominee River and just had a house built uh, 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 that was just finished in, in, um, up we're in the Upper Peninsula. I gave away all the construction equipment, everything, lock, stock, and barrel. I had a warehouse full of all kinds of things from redoing, remodeling, and, and doing uh, restoration. I did the Menominee County Courthouse in Menominee, Michigan. All that old oak and all that old, I just there, gave it all away. At first, I went to church, so, okay, I'm giving everything I own away. Come out of my house and take it. Nobody showed up. Then all of a sudden, they showed up just seeing what, what is this? It's sort of like, I felt like John the Baptist. Did you come out to see a guy dressed in camel hair and eating locusts, you know, or what? And, and so they were just shuffling their feet. And I, I, I piled everything outside the house in the yard and went to church says, if you don't get it, it's going to be destroyed by rain. You either take it or it's garbage. It's up to you. They came and shuffled there like Opie Taylor, you know, got shook. So. And, and finally, they started taking everything. We gave our cars. I, we didn't have a car to drive here. All our construction equipment we gave away. You know what God did? <clears throat> when we started to build here, I gave it away to a guy, Gordy Yeager. He worked with me, did uh, flat work, uh, uh, cement work on the jobs, and um, he headed that up. And um, he retired, and he was from Merrill. I didn't know he li lived out off of W. I know. So he retired. He comes back here to retire. He says, oh, here, to have all the, we were planning on building. We just had finished the, uh, where we're meet, where our uh, administrative building's now in, in our chapel. And uh, we were going to build this school. And all, he shows up. He says, hey, I got all this equipment. I want to give it back. Praise the Lord. We, used, we had all our own equipment, man. Backhoe and dump truck and scaffolding and every, I mean, everything. Cement work stuff, everything. Here it is. Praise God. Is God good or what? When we came here, there was a Jewish guy. I did a, a job for him, uh, for his brother, Corey. Their last names were Corey. And... Um, the Jewish folks, and um, he, the guy I did the job for, they made, the, they made wood furniture, not particle board furniture, but solid wood furniture, and uh, that were unfinished. And they sold them at Montgomery Ward Catalog and Sears and Pennies. I mean, just massive. And so you'd buy it and you'd finish it yourself, however you wanted to, so it was cheaper and it'd give you a little elbow grease stuff to do. And so anyway, I'm leaving town. I didn't know the guy. I met his brother, of course, but I didn't know, what was it, Jim was his name? I can't remember. Don, Corey, Don, thank you. Jesus. So I'm leaving town. I get a phone call. The only thing we had left in the house was a phone on the wall. And the phone rings. He says, yeah, oh, this is Don Corey. He says, oh, how are you doing? Great, great. He says, I heard you're leaving town. I said, I am. He said, well, you know, come on by my store. He had a store called the Wishing Well or something. I can't remember. And um, been, stayed friends with him until he passed away last year. But uh, he says, come on by my store. He said, I want, I want to give you something before you leave. No, I mean, we gave away all our money, everything. We had nothing. I had to, bar, I had to go to the neighbor's house uh, and uh, ask him, would you drive me and my family to Merrill, Wisconsin? Oh, really? Yeah, I'm moving? Yeah, I'm, we're moving. He says, well, I only got a pickup. I don't know if I can haul everything. I said, that's enough. I said, me and my wife, four kids, just kids sat in the back of the pickup. Me and Pam sat in the front. 
course, now today I wouldn't do that. But they sat in the back of the pickup, and they drove us here two and a half hours. And so he said, okay, so he drove us here. But on the way, I said, stop in Iron Mountain. Uh, so I was north of Iron Mountain. I said, stop in Iron Mountain away through. We're going to stop at Don Corey's store. So we stopped there. He says, here, I just really feel I have to give this to you. He says, great. And I started talking. He says, you know, you can go ahead, go. He said, I just need to give this to you. I get in the truck. I open up. It was 400 bucks. I get here to town. And uh, I'm, we're in town a couple weeks. And um, Pam says, you know, on the way here, she says, I really believe I'm supposed to go to work. You go ahead and witness on the streets and build the church. So, okay, I was reluctant, but she did. She got a job at Geis's down here. And I get a phone call from a, a bank in Kingsford, Michigan. And they said, what are we going to do? We have an, you have an account here. What are we going to do with the money in it? I said, I've, I've never stepped foot in your bank. I don't know who you are. They said, well, there's a money in an account here, and your name's on it. It's you. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, do an audit, because I'm not taking someone else's money. It's got to be a mistake. Something got put in there. It's somebody else's. I know it isn't mine. They said, no, it's, it's yours. That's why. We, we did an audit. I said, please, do another audit. You made a mistake. They said, okay. A couple weeks later, they called me back. They said, it's your money. It's nobody else's money. I said, well, how much is it? They said, $900. Of course, that was you know, almost 40 years ago. That was a good chunk of change. I said, what, really? They said, well, what do you want us to do with it? I said, have it at the teller cage. I'll be there in a couple hours. <laughs> this happened again and again and again. Why? Because I, 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 the Lord led me to, and I'm not telling, no, but you don't give away all your stuff. That was me. It was the walk I had to do. It was what God wanted to bring out of me, not just for me, for you. To pass on to you, to help you and encourage you. Say, God will provide all your needs. Amen? But it was the path he had for us. Look at it in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. When I first moved here, there was some ladies that gift, uh, they said, would you come and visit us? I said, okay, they lived in the assisted living here in town. So I, it was, I was only here a couple months. I went and visited them and, um, uh, they, and talked with them. And they were nice, sweet old ladies, you know. And um, they said, before you go, I want to give, one of them said, I want to give you a gift. I said, well, you don't have to do that. You know, I just, my pleasure to come and talk to you. They said, well, you no, know, it was my husband's, and I just want to give it to you. So she went in, uh, uh, had a little cloth over a door. She walked in, she walked out right away, and she had two ties in her hand. Both of them were hand-painted. Now, I don't know if anyone knows about hand-painted ties, but they were the 20s and 30s. You know, even into the 40s, they did hand-painted tie. It was silk, and somebody really painted it. It was beautiful. One with a big flower on it, and another one I think was more of a beachy Hawaiian look, you know. I thought they were cool. My kids said, I bring them home. My kids said, oh, you're not wearing them, are you? I said, of course. It's a gift from these. I love these. It meant a lot to her. It was her husband. She wanted to give them to me. Of course I'm going to wear them. And I wore them until because of sweating they wore out, you know. And then people really don't wear much ties anymore. But that's the thing. You have to know. You will grow in intimacy with God. That's what we saw in 2 Peter 1. He says, through the, the abundance of all these things God's going to give you, you are going to grow with him in divine nature. You just start letting God bless you and increase your life. You start giving to people good things and bless their life. You're going you're gonna to just grow in love with God and people. Amen? Paul said this, by, but this I say, 2 Corinthians 9, he says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And, read it with me, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Doesn't that sound like Jesus walking this earth? 
Yes, that's what he did for you. He became poor so you'd be that rich. You'd have an abundance of everything and give to every good work. Amen? It's God's plan of justice. This is justice to God. Once you receive Christ in your life, and I won't get it, but man, read Hebrews 10 and read through Isaiah 52, 53, 54 again. This is his plan of justice for you. You're receiving justice when you let him bless you, when you allow that to come in your life. You're receiving justice. Jesus received your justice, but you're receiving Jesus' justice. Amen? Romans 8, 31 and 32. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, read it, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Amen. Isn't God wonderful? Did you get something out of this? Wait till next week. We're going to talk about your emotions, your psychological issues. Man, you're going to be delivered, set free free. You're going to have an incredible life. God's done so many great things for us. That's why he said when you do this as communion or the Lord's table, come on guys, do it in remembrance of me. Do it in remembrance of me. Not just, hey, slug down this wine and eat a hunk of bread. He says, no, this is my body. This is my blood. Do it in remembrance of me. This is the abundance of all things everything. We're going to ask that you come on up. You know, before you do this, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ before, you need to right now. Right now. We're to examine ourselves. Are you in the faith? Have you given your life to the Lord? Otherwise, you eat and drink damnation on yourself. Not that God's punishing you. No, you're doing this out of covenant. And so what happens is just all kinds of the same junk is going to be happening to you, and you're going to say it doesn't work and blaspheme God's name. It does work. It's God, man. I know there's people watching out there right now. And in a couple weeks, they'll be listening again around here. We were awarded our FCC uh, frequency 102.5 praise God remember I told you last time now stop giving we had enough for what we were going to do until you're getting giving permission by the government you can't even buy anything that you need to put to do what we're doing otherwise they'll take away your privilege for the rest of your life that's their law so we waited but now we have that permission I'm asking you bring in some money we do have extra that was brought in the first time, but it's not enough. We, we have enough for the antenna. Other than that, we need a, a, um, the, the broadcasting system itself has to be built for this new frequency. So we're going to need you to bring in, I know we're doing this playground, but you, God's given you enough that we can, you can give to every good work. Amen? Either it's true or he isn't. So I'm going to ask you to bring in money. We need just a couple thousand bucks. We'll be up and on the air with a greater distance, greater radius of our signal now. Praise the Lord. And um, I'll explain more to you another time. But I just forgot about it. I want to bring that in. What he's saying right here, he said this. Come on up, by the way. And go ahead and part. Oh, we're going to pray, right? Those listening, I didn't forget about you. Well, I did a little bit. But Father, in Jesus' name, everyone just pray with me right now. Say, God... In the name of Jesus, forgive me for all my sin. I've been living without you all my life. But I'm gaining knowledge in who you are. So Jesus, I'm going to give my life to you, my Redeemer, my Savior, my scapegoat, my sacrifice. I give you my life and you give me yours. I give you what I can do with my life, and you give me what you can do with my life. So let's get the party started. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen and amen. If you're just giving your life to the Lord, you're born again, a child of Almighty God. Amen.
All of angels are celebrating. Come on up, go ahead and let's have uh, communion. Take it back to your seat and we'll do it all together. I want to thank you for your patience. I had a hard time getting, just going this long. Haven't been here in a month. Thank you, Jesus. I hope you're getting something from this series. I, I'm telling you, this is just good stuff. Eye-opening. Revolutionize who you are as a Christian. You know, when I was in Philippines one time, I was asked by a... I'd just done a convention in Dundee, Scotland. I came home, preached like I am now at a Sunday morning service. Then in the afternoon, I was flying out to... Uh, the Philippines on the island of Luzon, Luzon um, in the city of Angeles, Angeles City. And I went there. I can tell you a hundred stories, but during the day, at, I started at night, a crusade. Phenomenal blowout, what God did. Next day, in the morning, they wanted me to teach the minister. So there's about 200 in a room. And... Um, I'm, I'm just said, let's lift our hands and let the Holy Spirit do to us what he wants. And the bishop of that organization stood up and said, Dr. Holman, we don't have a Bible college. And the reason we asked you here was to teach our students. So if you could, we need some Hebrew or some Greek. You know, teach us some things that we can use to help us study and prepare ourselves for our congregations. So I did a Greek study in Romans 8, you know, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made us free of, from the law of sin and death. I said, now let's lift our hands and pray and let the Holy Ghost do what he wants to do. Man, he blew up in that place. It was chaos. Like people were laughing and crying. There was people screaming. It was what God was doing. I had no clue, but it was phenomenal. And there was a lady that come up to me. Uh, she looked pretty young but she wasn't, but she looked pretty young, and she'd come up with another gal, and she was pointing at her Bible, and, and she'd point in her finger, and to me it sounded like this. She was saying, goo goo ga ga, goo goo ga ga, goo goo ga ga. And I couldn't understand her, so I asked her friend, what's she saying? She says, I don't know. She, she's not speaking Tagalog, which is their native language, and she says, she's not speaking English. I said, yeah, I, I hear that. She says, I don't know what she's speaking. I said, well, I don't know neither. Let's just pray. And Father, I thank you, Lord. Just whatever you're doing to this lady, praise the Lord. We bless her and we thank you for mighty things in her life. And she took off. Afterwards, they brought me to a room with about 40 of their lead ministers from this, this uh, um, denomination. And we were eating and um, outside... They had the door closed, and outside there was a big hallway going by. And all of a sudden, there was a pounding at the door, really loud, just, just, I mean, everyone heard it and looked up. But I kept talking with whoever and didn't really pay much attention. Pretty soon, this gal comes up to me and says, Dr. Holman, there was a pastor who wants to talk to you in the hallway. So I go out in the hallway, and here's this little gal and, um, uh, and this man who obviously was her pastor, and he got mad at me and started hollering at me, what'd you do to this girl, you know? I said, I, nothing, I didn't touch her, I, nothing. He said, I said, why? Well, she can only speak in Chinese. I said, how do you know? She says, well, I was a missionary in China, I speak Chinese. She can only speak in Chinese, she can only write in Chinese. She can't speak in Tagalog or write in Tagalog, she can't talk in Tagalog or write in, or in English, write in English. She can only speak and write in Chinese. What are we going to do? I said, don't look at me. I didn't do it. Honest. I said, well, is there something wrong with that? She says, well, what she? he said, what's she going to say to her husband when she goes home? I said, good point. I said, just explain to him what God's doing. So they took off. I prayed over them, be blessed, filled, you know. They take off, they, next morning, that, that night I did the crusade, and then in the morning, again, all the pastors were back with about 100 more. I mean, they came in because of what God was doing. And I said, before we start, I want to ask, was that young lady here that was last, that yesterday could only speak in Chinese, a little hand raised up? I said, well, come up here. I said, can you speak in English now? She said, yes, sir. 
I said, how about Tagalog? She says, yes. I said, well, can you explain to us what happened? They got, brought a microphone, gave it to her. She says, well, she says, when I went home, my, my husband wouldn't believe my pastor. Said he, that I'm lying, that this is a trickery. And he says, no, honest. So she says, well, why don't you go home and get your wife? Surely he'll believe your wife. So he went home, got his wife, explained to her. She come back, talked to him. He says, no, I don't believe this stuff. So she said, I prayed, and I asked the Lord, what should I do? And he said, have him sit in the chair. You pray for him. I'll do the exact same thing to him. So he did. He sat in the chair. She prayed for him. Bang. Couldn't speak in English or Tagalog. Couldn't write in English or Tagalog. Only Chinese. She started laughing a little bit. I said, well, what's wrong with that? Well, he had to go to work this morning and he manages a tire company. And nobody's going to understand him. He won't know what to do. I said, well, when did you start speaking in English again in Tagalog? And she says, right when he started speaking in Chinese. I could speak normal then. But I still can speak Chinese. I can still write perfect Chinese. I asked her, why did God do this to you? She said, well, me and my husband were raised in the mountains over here in a little village. And as a young age, we just both knew that we were going to be missionaries to China. And we got married. We went to Bible college. We, 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 but we couldn't speak, we couldn't learn Chinese or, or write Chinese. She says, we even went to a special school. Just They, they, te- they have schools missionary Chinese or missionary Spanish or whatever. And you just learn what you need to do to declare the message of God, right? And so she says, we even went to there. We couldn't, we couldn't learn. She says, for over 20 years, we thought we were a failure, that we failed God. We were condemned. We thought we were damaged goods, no good anymore. We'd never do what God wanted to do. We felt so guilty and ashamed. I said, well, how about now? She laughed again. I said, well, what's, why are you laughing now? She says, well, because my pastor, you know where he is? I said, no. He, she said, he's at, the, uh, he's at the travel agency. He's buying us both two tickets to China, and we're going to both leave this week to be missionaries and fulfill God's purpose. Everything that pertains unto life and godliness He's given to you. You're not trying to get it. He's given it to you. You got to learn how not to be working to please God, but living to receive from God. Just let him do it. Let him give to you. Let him, yes, that's what communion's about. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. I don't care how old you are. Your future is still in God's hands. It doesn't matter what. Whatever it is, he'll fulfill for you. He'll supply for you. He'll heal you, deliver you, bless you. I prayed for a woman that uh, recently, uh, last year, that couldn't have children, had two miscarriages. I went back and did a healing crusade just several months ago, and she was there. I was telling about the, uh, some story that revolved around this family, and the pastor said, that woman is here with her son. Just like you said, she had a son. The doctor said she was pregnant, and the doctor said, you'll never have this child, and, and you can never have children again. And by trying to give life to this child, you might die. You need an abortion. And so she cried and cried and cried. And I said, no, you will live and not die. This child will live. You're having children. I command your womb healed. Here she came with that little baby, said, please bless us. Of course. God's here for you, guys. He isn't against a one, not a person on the face of this planet. He just wants us to turn to him, to accept his love and his goodness. That's what communion's about. So everyone just tell him, Father, I receive right now. And whatever it is, accept it. I receive healing in my body. I receive finances, Lord God. Wealth and riches are in my house. Not to heap on ourselves, but to do the work of the ministry, to fulfill his plan. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you 
Thank you for fulfilling purpose, for fulfilling promises, for giving dreams and visions and allowing lives to get better and expand and increase, all by the power of your love. When you came to this earth, you created man with love. When you walked in this earth as a redeemer, you came in love. And when you died on the cross, you poured out your love. And so we receive it in Jesus' name. So everyone in here, receive your miracle now. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Do you, do you love God? We're going to collect these little dealies for you, pass them over to one side here, and we'll thank you. I think they're all passed over to here, John. If you just walk down here, you'll get them all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Mm, I love God. Everyone lift your hands to Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bless these wonderful people. I command your goodness to rain down on them mightily. Holy Ghost, come. Do whatever you want to do and however you want to do it in us. Move in our lives. Let your blessings flow. Let your goodness, Father, move in us and, and, and cause us to just fall in greater love with you. Your love is brought into our hearts right now by the Holy Spirit. And so every blessing, Father, is ours. We lack no good thing. Our bodies walk in divine health in Jesus' name. Every organ and every tissue, I command these bodies to live. Every organ and every tissue, I command that you function perfectly in Jesus' name. None will fall short of any blessings. Father, as they receive your word, as they allow righteousness to rule in them, not their righteousness because of their work or their goodness, but the righteousness that Jesus gifted us is right as God. Thank you, Lord. Blessing, healing, delivering, multiplying, giving, helping, opening doors. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Fear, leave in Jesus' name. Go. How dare you be in a temple of the living God? Go. You're healed. Don't you dare fear. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful day, for your incredible word, and for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And everyone said, amen, and amen. God bless you.